Namaskar. In the last class, we looked at how multitasking happens. I also described what is multitasking and the nature of multitasking. Then I described the information processing framework which is responsible for processing information and how learning about the principles of information processing can help us in multitasking. I also discussed the sensory register and short term memory as two concepts which help us in understand how information is processed. Very briefly multitasking is doing many jobs at the same time. Now, if you want to be successful in handling many jobs at the same time or more than one job at the same time, you should understand how information is processed within the human mind and keeping that idea, I tried to explain how information is processed. In the last class, I explained how sensory receptors, they are capable of handling so much information which is being sent to them. Also the fact that how sensory registers temporarily store all information which is available to them and how using attention as a filter, they allow some information to pass and block other information. We also saw and tested the claim that all information is available in sensory register, but for very brief period of time. Further, we looked at different kinds of sensory register, the icon being visual and the eco being for auditory. So, when information passes from the sensory register, it moves on to a store which temporarily holds information for a longer duration of time, but the capacity of the store is small. We discussed the idea of short term memory and I explained to you how the short term memory works and what are the limitations of short term memory. In terms of engineering psychology, if you are designing a website or if you are designing an interface or a machine which is supposed to help human, understanding what is short term memory and for how long it can hold information is essential because that will help you in designing better interfaces and designs which can assist humans rather than hinder the work of humans. Now, one question that I left you with in the last class was if short term memory is a store which is temporary and it only holds information passively, how then complex activities like driving or reading happens? Now, for reading to happen or for driving to happen, people have to constantly update information. If you are driving, you will have to constantly look at the speedometer, look at street signs and not only store these street signs and speedometer information, but also keep on updating it, changing it with the requirement of driving. You would notice how different traffic lights changes, what different signs are there on the road and how you should maneuver your driving according to these signs. Also understand that Looking at a signboard and understanding its meaning requires you to access stored information. So, if short term memory is a store which only passively keeps information, 
how do we drive? The answer to this question was provided by Alan Badley and Hitch in their concept of working memory. Newer research suggests that the structure of short term memory can be better explained by working memory and I will briefly explain how this working memory helps in solving some of the problems that short term memory was not able to handle. So, what is the conceptualization like? Bradley and H reconceptualized short term memory as a part of a dynamic multi component process. What H and Bradley suggest that instead of one short term memory which is dependent on acoustic coding or verbal coding and which has 7 plus or minus 2 chunks as a limitation and a 20 second duration for information without rehearsal. How does memory helps us in complex tasks? The answer to this lies in developing a model where not only information is stored, but this information is more active. An active information is able to communicate with long term storage and in the real time borrow rules and information which is needed for solving a problem. Looking at the reading example, when you are reading a text, you are not only producing sound and reading the text, you are also trying to understand what the text means. If you read a paragraph, each word has a meaning and this meaning is stored somewhere in your head in the working memory and this long term memory which has the meaning stored about each word passes this information to working memory through a two way communication system. So, when you read a sentence you not only try to evaluate the meaning of each word, but also how these words combine together mean something and for that you not only need a store for storing incoming information as in what words are present and how they are arranged, you also need to understand what these words mean. So, Badley and Hitch devised a model where there are not only stores, but there is a supervisory system, a connection system which communicates with long term memory and is able to bring forth information which is necessary for understanding the meaning of information which is coming from sensor register. Now, how does the working memory look like? It is a three tiered system with central executive at the top and this central executive is the master controller and the phonological loop and the visual special sketch pad as two slave systems, two secondary systems. The phonological loop and the sketch pad are storage units, whereas the central executive is the unit which manages information which is coming from the sensor register and also inputs which are coming from the temporary storage of phonological loop and the sketch pad combines them and initiates a two way communication with long term storage. The long term storage has meaning rules facts stored with it 
and with the help of these facts the incoming information plus the short stored information within its slave system the central executive can extract meaning from the incoming information the phonological store has two parts there is the store and the articulatory loop and the visual spatial sketch pad has two parts which is the visual cache and the scribe so how does this system work then i'll very briefly show it to you so here is my sensory register it takes a number of information from the external world then using attention it sends limited information so assuming that these are four information it sends limited information to the central executive the central executive is a attentional system it works like a supervisor or manager in a company whose job is to manage work rather than do the work and sends this information to two slave system so the central executive takes information from the sensory register and passes it down to two slave systems you have the phonological loop and you have the visual special sketch pad the loop phonological loop is divided into two sub parts you have the articulatory loop and you have the store all information which is coming from the auditory sense organs are passed to the phonological loop the phonological loop is a temporary buffer which stores auditory information for small periods of time when you speak all words that you speak has to be active for short duration of time for you to understand what is being spoken so all words which are coming to the central executive are pushed to the phonological loop the phonological loop sends this information to the phonological store which stores basic information in your auditory stimulus like what is the noun what is the verb what is the object because this is what is needed in terms of understanding what a sentence means and the articulatory loop keeps on looping this information similarly is the idea of visual special sketch pad which is having a cache and a scribe the cache keeps temporary visual and spatial information and the scribe helps in arranging this information which is visual or special in nature in organized way and when the central executive asks for this information this visual special sketch pad and the phonological loop sends this back this information to the central executive the central executive also has something called the episodic buffer which is a connection between the central executive and long term memory so the central executive stores temporary information in these two loops and it communicates with long term memory using this episodic buffer and then using all this information one from the register the other from the long term memory and the third information from this temporary loops it makes meaning of information so this is the design of how the working memory works now as i discussed the central executive is a supervisory system and is least studied and understood the job of central executive is like the manager it takes information manages information extracts meaning and then sometimes also modifies information 
The central executive connects to long term memory. I have just explained how the central executive talks to long term memory. What is long term memory? Next is that we are going to study. The long term memory is the typical idea of memory that people understand. It is a space where information is stored. So, central executive connects to this long term memory and takes information back from long term memory to make meaning from those information which is coming from the phonological loop and the sketch pad. The job of central executive is to plan and find the best strategy. So, looking back at the example that I gave you in the last class, if you are driving and suddenly a kid jumps in front of your car, what should you do? Depends upon where the kid is. If the kid is to the periphery of the car, he has not reached at a distance where he would be hit by the car. You can maneuver the car in such a way that you can escape hitting this kid. But assuming that the kid is in front of you, you would press the brakes hard or use alternate measures to stop the car. Now, which decision should you take is a job of the central executive. It plans what should I do and then selects the best strategy. What is the best thing to do in a situation? If the kid has just jumped, but there is enough space for you to maneuver the car, it will maneuver the car because stopping a car which has a higher momentum is more difficult than maneuvering it in easy ways. And then the third job of central executive is attentional switching. It is like that person in a discussion forum who moderates. So, what people in a discussion forum do is they start discussing ideas. The job of the moderator is to understand and let people speak at their own time. At the end of it, he gives a brief meaning of the talk. This is the job of central executive. It switches attention in the sense that it decides which system should be active when. This is the job of an attentional system and based on inputs from these different systems that we talked about, it plans as to what should I do. So, in the car example, the central executive will get information from the eyes, the proprioceptive cues from the hands and also the visual cues from the car and the road. Sometimes you also get auditory cues from the passenger sitting right next to you, he is shouting a warning and so all these cues are then combined together. The job of central executive is to switch between these cues and also bring in information from long term memory as to what has to be done. So, this is the job of central executive. Now, we talked about long term memory and I described long term memory as a store which keeps all the information. So, let me briefly define what is long term memory. Information which is rehearsed in the short term memory or information which the central executive thinks is valuable for a person gets transferred from working memory to long term memory through repetition and elaboration. There are two ways of storing information in long term memory. One, you can passively repeat an information. It is similar to rote memory 
An example of rote memory is all those mantras and sloks and Hanuman Chalisa that you know. So, while reciting these sloks or this Hanuman Chalisa, if somebody disturbs you, you will forget the whole Chalisa from the point where you are being disturbed and you have to start over again. The idea is that it is a rote memory. You have not learned this memory or this chalisa by understanding its meaning. You have mugged it up. So, one way of transferring information from short term memory or working memory to long term memory is using this kind of repeated rehearsal. The other way is making meaning. I can take an information and assign a meaning. So, I see a particular flower and I can associate a meaning with that flower. I see a tulip and then associate a meaning saying that tulips was the first thing that I saw when I first went for and student exchange in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, you have a lot of tulips and all memories of tulip now gets associated with Netherlands. So, tulip now represents Netherlands and this is elaboration, taking an information and assigning it a meaning. Two ways of storing information in long term memory, either rote repetition or assigning meaning and these information get stored in long term memory for infinite time. One feature of long term memory is it never loses information, only the connections are lost. So, information is always stored in long term memory, but the chances are that you either did not encode that information, you never put attention to that information and send, sent it to long term memory or you have lost the connection just like you lose a key to a lock and the lock then cannot be opened. So, information is never lost from long term memory rather information retrieval failure can lead to unavailability, unavailability of information. Some more feature. So, long term memory has a distinct memory system which stores and organized various types of memories. Tulwing has an organization structure for long term memory which says that most long term memory is divided into two parts. You have a conscious form and you have a non-conscious form. A conscious form of memory is called the declarative memory and the non-conscious is called the procedural memory. Conscious memory is that memory which you can define. So, your experiences, your experience of visiting the park or visiting a party. Non-conscious form of memory is riding a bicycle, certain habits that you have. You are doing an act, but you do not know why you are doing. This is non-conscious. You are doing an act and you have awareness of what you are doing. This is conscious form. Now, in the within the conscious form, you have two types of memory. You have the selective, uh, you have the semantic and you have the episodic. The semantic form of memory is about rules and other information and episodic is about personal episodes. So, semantic memory holds general knowledge, knowledge about where is south, where is north, where is America, where is Africa, what is the national bird of America or which country uses which kind of currency rules as in how to add numbers, how to subtract numbers, how exchange of electrons are balanced on a chemical re, uh, equation and facts. Facts like the sun always rises in the east given the fact that you are on this planet and it is rotating at a certain speed other facts like 
how many continents are there and that kind of a thing. So, those facts which are not unique to individuals and they are publicly available are called semantic memory and examples could be addition rules or direction senses. Episodic memory on the other hand consists of personal experiences arranged temporarily in order of occurrences. So, episodic memory holds information in terms of time when something happened. So, you went to a birthday party. The whole event is arranged in time as in how when you entered, what you did after that till the completion of the party itself. There are several events which happen and they are arranged in time and this is episodic memory. There is another form of memory which is called procedural which I just described for you is that memory which is non-conscious and it holds information like skills. How do you play a guitar? How do you ride a bicycle? That kind of skills. Certain habits. Why do certain people touch their head? Why do certain people when sitting on higher surfaces move their leg or people nail bite? All of these are habits and certain motor memories which are acquired through extensive practice. Playing a guitar, driving, all these are procedural memory. Now, memories are divided in terms of occurrences. Memories that happened in the past is called the retrospective and the one which is happening in future is called the prospective. So, memories about your 12th class farewell is retrospective, but the memory about you taking a medicine at 6 pm today is future memory or memories about those events that you have to do in the evening today are prospective memories. So, memories then have a retrospective and a prospective differentiation. Prospective memories are episodic memories that help in remembering to remember the future actions. Taking a medicine at some point of time, picking up the kid from the school in future time or visiting the market to buy certain things in future. These kind of memories are called prospective memories. Remember that prospective memories have two parts. One, a fact to remember an intention that should be done in future, but what should be done in future that is the retrospective component. So, prospective memory has a future intention which is the act that you have to do in future plus what act has to be done is stored in the retrospective part of memory. Failures of prospective memory are causes of embarrassment, but in some cases significant potential harms could also result. You do not remember if you have taken medicine and you take it again in future, overdose of medicine could be a problem and so failures of prospective memory could be problem doing certain acts of in future. You were supposed to pick up the kid from school, you forgot and now it is too late. The kid is still waiting at the school for you, anything can happen to him. And so, failures of prospective memory are a form of embarrassment or problem. Now, PM failures have contributed to a number of aircraft mishaps. While flying an aircraft, the pilot has to remember certain actions that he has to do in future. Lower the wheel, pull up the flap. These are actions which can happen after the flight has taken off, but he forgets doing that, it can be an aircraft mishap. Now, failures of intention are more likely under conditions of stress or high workload where other task demands compete for limited attention. If failures of prospective memory happen, this is generally because either the pilot is under stress or any operator is under stress or he is at the same point of time doing multiple jobs. And if he is doing multiple jobs, if he is trying to accomplish a number of jobs, then he would naturally fail to remember what he has to do in future. Now, to avoid failures, people employ a lot of strategies. For example, they make alarms, they create a to-do list 
and they post notices and calendars. This helps them in remembering what they have to do and when they have to do in future. Now for effectiveness, the cues must be associated with a particular intention and a high probability of being spotted. If you want to create a list or a reminder for some action in future, it should be placed in a sense and at a place where you can easily notice. Maybe on the fridge because fridge is something which people notice when taking out food or at a place where you look most of your days like on the computer screen. So, using these kind of helps prospective memory failures can be avoided. Now, we have looked at memory which is one part of how information is managed. But for information to get stored and passed on from the sensory register to the working memory, attention is required. So, what is attention? Attention is that cognitive process which help us in deciding which information to process and which information to leave behind. So, prioritizing information is one of the main actions of attention. We use the term attention every day, however, this there is a confusion over the meaning of it. Why is there a confusion? There are two reasons. One, attention is being described in different ways and so there is no one common definition of attention. The other reason is that measuring attention is difficult. The moment you ask somebody not to pay attention to a job, he will pay attention. So, how do you measure a situation with no attention? Because if you ask somebody not to pay attention to something, he is going to pay attention to it. Now, we will look at one of these features which is the various definitions. Now, difficulty in defining attention arises from different names which have been given to attention. Attention has one name which is called selective attention in which attention is about performing a single task. Attention also defines and helps in performing a multiple task which is called divided attention. And there is a third type of attention which is called maintaining focus on an object for extended period of time and this is called sustained attention. So, three types of attention doing single job or picking single objects from multiple objects is selective attention. Doing many jobs multitasking at the same time is divided attention and focusing on one task for longer periods of time is called sustained attention. Reading in example of selective attention, driving and talking is an example of divided attention and focusing on coloring or painting, making an art is an example of sustained attention. Now, the target of attention is always an object feature. It could be an entire object, it could be a group of object or it could be a space with target expectancy. So, when I say pay attention, I am referring to either some particular feature of an object as in pay attention to the upper part of a cup or the lower part of a cup. An entire object, pay attention to the clock. Grouping of objects, pay attention to the bunch of trees and not to the background. Group of objects and space with target expectancy, pay attention to the display because that is where the warning would come. So, displays are known to be a place which gives you visual warning. So, pay attention to that is another target of an attention. 
what does attention do it helps us in able to detect certain stimuluses and warnings not only detection it also helps us in identifying when you pay attention you are quicker in detecting things and also identifying where does this thing belong now this property of attention uses working memory and this is a job of central executive identifying part and distinguishing between objects so attention not only helps us in detecting but it also helps us in identifying and distinguishing objects what are the factors which influence attention a number of factors are influencing attention certain task related demands influence attention certain task require you to monitor a certain display when you are using a sewing machine the cloth which is moving forward while you are seeing that demands more of your attention than the hand mechanism through which you move the machine because if you don't pay attention to the cloth the sewing will be all wrong so certain task related characters help you decide where to pay attention experiences are also helpful in making you decide where to pay attention let's take an example if i say there is a bird in this room your experience suggests that birds generally fly and so the bird would possibly on, be on the roof there are very few chances that you will actually look at the floor to see the bird and so experiences guide attention and certain situational factors also guide attention there can be situations which take more of your attention from the job that you are doing you are sitting in a quiet room and reading and a ding happens this ding signifies the finished process of your microwave oven where you are making coffee now it was a quiet room and you are reading and this ding captures attention which tells you that the coffee is done so these are such a situation factors which capture your attention task related demands comprise of factors specific to task like experience driver search for rear view mirrors mostly on gear change i have given the examples but once again i am repeating these examples to task related factors demand comprise of factors specific to task experiences and here the example that i have listed is the switching of attention to the rear view mirror to check if other vehicles are near you or far away from you why it is only during gear change when you change gear you shift between speeds so when you shift between speeds there is a probability that a car which is coming in front of you or which is behind you will not know what you are doing if you suddenly decrease or increase speed this has to be explicitly told to the driver behind you but how do you know if there is somebody behind you or not that is only possible by looking at the rear view mirror if there is no one you can easily change lanes but if there is someone you can have to use a indicator to change lanes and decide if somebody is very near to your car then decide whether you should let him pass and then change lanes or do some other action so task related factors attention based on experiences uses the top down control like searching over head for indoor lighting or control in car we have discussed this also we are in your car and you are searching for indoor light experience suggests that light should always be on the roof and so you fiddle your finger on the roof to find the light example of situational factors is that bottom up processes help in making shifts of attention here like suddenly appearing of a kid with a bicycle while driving now the focus of just one activity 
like reading is selective attention we discuss four different types of three different types of attention selective divided and sustained or vigilance what we'll do now is we'll take each of these attention one by one and try to understand what do they mean and what is their nature the first form of attention is called selective attention here people focus on just one activity and a good example is reading what does selective attention do it filters out irrelevant information thereby freeing cognitive capacity so it's so when you are reading and something else is going in your mind like what food would be there in the hostel selective attention helps you in getting rid of this second information about food and focusing on what you are reading because if your mind is free of distracting thoughts you will have a lot of cognitive capacity and this cognitive capacity can then be utilized in reading and understanding the meaning of text that you are reading selective attention is a critical property of behavior as cognitive capacity is limited and information available is huge attention is about picking up relevant information and their selective attention is more important because as we saw earlier that sensory organs receive a lot of information from the external world but within this lots of information you have to shuffle and find out the relevant information for any task that you need to accomplish for that to happen selective attention is essential because what it would do is block out all irrelevant information and only process the relevant information you are in a room which is a control room of a nuclear power plant or a power plant and a lot of information is available to you but your job is to monitor the various controls so what you would do is you would focus on those controls which signify system critical situations and by monitoring those system critical situations you will be able to accomplish your job so all other information which is coming to you in terms of colleagues talking or the ac running that can be filtered out and by using selective attention you can focus on those panels and displays which give you information about system critical functions now selective attention is influenced by four factors expectancy knowledge of probability of an event and where information is likely to be found people's expectancy about how frequent is something happening and where can it be found again the boiler example we are working in a control room of a power plant by experience you know that critical system information is available on a display which is above the controls and you know that this display will only light up or change color when it becomes eminent to perform an action like shutting down the plant or shutting down a certain function of a plant so expectancy will help you in ignoring that display if everything is normal but if that display comes about you will stop processing all other information and start looking at only those display instead of rumbling through all other displays so expectancies and probabilities of events define selective attention the value the likelihood of an operator monitoring information available in a channel even if the probability of the event is low in a war time when people are monitoring radars to look for enemy aircraft even a small blip will make the air traffic controller alert defense forces to look and destroy 
the enemy aircraft. But if it is a normal uh, situation where no war is going on, the air traffic controller can relax and let the information come for longer periods of time and then decide this action because alerting the air force that an enemy is there when it is only a bird or some other object which is creating that blip on the radar screen would be expensive and time consuming. So, value as in how much important that decision is will decide selective attention. Salience, certain stimuli features are novel and they capture your selective attention. The influence of bottom up or stimulus based factors are brightness, color and motion. A number of times on a website you would have find that certain text blink and they capture your attention because it is blinking very fast or it has a high refresh rate, it changes color, color very fast and it captures attention. This is the saliency part and effort, the likelihood of engaging in certain visual behaviors due to physical effort necessary to perform that behavior. Effort that you do in a certain action will also influence your selective attention. If a certain button or knob has to be pushed for doing an act, it is going to capture your selective attention more than if it is an automated system which does not require you to do an action. The expectancy and value which is the probability where a particular event will happen and the likelihood or how important that particular stimulus is, is a top down process or a top down factor which influences attention whereas salience and effort are bottom up because effort is determinant on how much information you are getting. If you are getting all the information in one display, you may not have to move your head to the left and right to get secondary information in terms of taking action. But if the information which is available to you in your display is not sufficient, you would have to do more effort in terms of understanding what the situation is and in those cases the salience and effort are bottom up process. Now, the, effective of the effectiveness of selective attention process appears to rely on two mechanisms. Selective attention or focusing on one object is dependent on two features. One, a perceptual process that filters irrelevant information under conditions of high perceptual demands and a cognitive top down process that filters irrelevant stimulus guided by expectancies and knowledge of target properties. So, how you select one information from a number of information is dependent on perceptual process or how do you decide to differentiate between what to put your attention to and what not to put your attention to. Further to it, there is also a cognitive process which is involved and these processes are guided by expectancy. The example that I have given you is a flanker compatibility test which talks about the perceptual process in selective attention. Flanker's test is a very easy test. In this what happens is a number of letters are presented to you and then there is a distractor which is presented beside these numbers. So, you have a group of numbers or letters and there is a distractor here and there are two conditions. One is a heterogeneous condition and another is a homogeneous condition. In a heterogeneous condition, these letters are all similar and a in a homogeneous condition, these letters are all similar and in a heterogeneous condition, these letters that are presented to you which are called non-targets are all dissimilar, the different letters and you have a distractor. Now, your job is to look at a target which is this and find out whether this target is present here in these letter strings. You also have a distractor 
which can take away your attention. You can read more about flanker's task, but results of the flanker task suggest that if you are too engrossed in doing this job of lateral identification, finding out whether this target is present, this target is present in this letter string, then distractors won't be processed. But if these targets and these non-targets are easy, this distractor will create problem in processing. In very simple words, if we have different type of letters here and you have to match this letter to this different type of letters, you will, it will require more effort for you to do the matching. And so, you will have very less attentional resources left to process this distractor. But if most of these letters which are uh, here are same or similar, in those cases you will easily be able to decide whether this target is present in this particular letter string or not. And in those cases the available extra F attention will spill out to this distractor. The distractor is going to stop you or is going to uh, disrupt your performance. This is Franker task. Now, in terms of the cognitive top down process, what it suggests is if you know properties of stimuli or certain expectancies of stimuli, it will help you in pay paying uh, attention. Remember the example that I told you where if I ask you where is the bird, your expectancy say suggests that birds fly and they are always on the uh, roof and so you will look at the roof, you will pay attention to the roof rather than on the floor. There are also chances that bird can be on the floor, but there are higher chances that the bird could all only be on the roof and so you will focus your attention on the roof. The second class of attention is called divided attention. It is the ability to divide attention among two or more tasks. Multitasking is an example of this. Now, when you multitask, there are a number of features that you should be aware of. First, you should have mastery of individual components. To multitask, you should know all components. Second, you should be able to coordinate between tasks. If two tasks are equally difficult or very difficult, you cannot coordinate between them. For example, driving and talking. Now, if you are not an expert in driving, then you cannot talk. But if you are an expert in driving, then you can talk. So, you can coordinate between the task. And shifting attention between this task, central executive. If both the tasks are easy, you can keep on shifting attention between the two tasks. If both the tasks are difficult, you cannot shift attention because each of them will compete for attention. So, a uh, very important discussion is going on in the car and you are driving in a, uh, in a city with too much traffic. Both the tasks cannot be done at the same point of time. You cannot listen to the conversation as well as drive and so in those cases it cannot happen. But if one task is automatic, if you are driving on a uh, highway with less distractions, you can look at this engrossed conversation and answer questions. Parser suggests that decision process represents an obstacle in bottleneck to effective multitasking. Parser suggests that multitasking gets into a problem when two stimulus appears at the, when two information appears at the same point of time. Now, if both the tasks are equally difficult, the two tasks will compete with each other and they cannot be parallelly processed. They have to be sequentially processed. There is a phenomena in psychology which is called PRP or the psychological reflective period. In very simple word, it what it means is if two people approaches a bank teller and both of them start giving their numbers, bank account number for getting some information from the teller. The teller can keep one number in his working memory and give information to the other person about his bank account. But let us assume the first person comes first, he gives his number and the teller has now got into the process of finding information about 
the first number then a second person comes in and he gives his number to the bank teller and asks information about the account now the bank teller cannot do two, the two jobs at the same time since he is not selecting a response as in what is the detail of information about the first person bank account he cannot focus attention on the other account number which has been given to you by the second person and find information but if both of them appear together or if both of them appear at the time when a response execution happens then this is easy so again in simple words what it means is that multitasking is only possible when you have one task as automatic and the other task as simple if one the task is automatically happening the second task can be provided attention to but if both tasks are requiring your attention they cannot be processed in parallel rather there will be a sequel and sequential processing what are some of the ways in which multitasking can happen this particular phenomena is called controlled versus automatic processing now automatic process suggests that skills that have become automatic and that can be performed with little effort as a result of extensive practice what it means is that if you are an expert driver you can drive automatically and then you can in those cases you can talk to important conversations that is happening in the car or fiddle with your radio control processes are skills requiring cognitive effort and oversight because they have not been practiced enough and they lack consistency mapping between the stimulus and response what it suggests is control tasks are those tasks which you cannot perform automatically conversation for example you are driving driving is automatic but the conversation which is happening could be about any event and you don't know what event it would be so your response is dependent on what is being asked from you and what information is being fed by the co passenger and so it cannot be an automatic reply it has to be a controlled reply and in those cases attention has to be put more on to that job because that job requires specific input now here i have talked about consistent mapping between stimulus and response what it suggests is that if the stimulus and response have consistent mapping in the in the sense that the stimulus is similar to the response it becomes easier for you to handle it but if the stimulus is different from the response then doing control processing becomes more difficult if somebody is talking to you the response is in terms of a talk so it's easier but if somebody says show me the map now the command was in verbal but your action has to be in terms of a motor movement and so the stimulus and response are two different types of responses and so in this case the control processing will be more difficult to achieve now there is a role of variable and consistent mapping on the development of automatic processing the more consistent mapping that you have between stimulus and uh, response the more automatic a particular task can be done but if the stimulus and response are two different responses then you have to do control processing so multitasking is easier if the stimulus and response if what is being asked and the action that you have to do are similar but if it if you are want to do multitasking in a way that the task is something else and the information which is being provided to you is something else in those cases it becomes difficult and lastly we talk about something called sustained attention sustained attention is basically vigilance vigilance is the ability to sustain attention across an extended period of time it was tested by something called a classic clock, clock test and what happens here in the classic uh, clock test a clock was given to people and the clock moved in such a way that in one hour it does two movements two jumps and that happens 30 times in one hour 
the job of people were to find those time frames in which the clock does two jumps generally the clock will jump one unit for one time frame but sometimes the this clock will jump two units it will move two distances the job of the people who were doing this test was to notice how many times it was done now the reports of this test suggest that people after a period of time were not able to accurately tell what was happening and this is vigilance so th why does vigilance happen why is it difficult for people to keep their attention on a task for longer duration of time there are two theories one the sensitivity hypothesis which says that decre decrement in observers ability to discriminate between signal and noise as time passes people become lower in sensitivity in discriminating what is that particular object where you should focus your attention and what is that particular object in which you should not focus your attention think about reading for a period of time you will be able to focus it but then other thoughts would come to your head and it will take away your attention and take away your vigilance the second uh, hypothesis is called the arousal hypothesis which suggests that reduced ability to maintain high levels of alertness happened because of perceptual habituation if you look at a stimulus for longer periods of time the perceptual system becomes overburden it becomes habituated and it uses its own shortcut for finding things you would remember finding differences between two different figures find five differences the first three differences is easy but finding the fourth and fifth difference become difficult because the same image is in front of you for longer duration of time and so your eyes become habituated to it and the other reason for arousal hypothesis or losing of vigilance due to arousal hypothesis is because of motivation as time progresses people get demotivated and because of this demotivation they are not able to put their attention back in paying vigilance or scanning something for a longer period of time so two hypotheses sensitivity and arousal suggest why people lose focus when they are looking at something for extended periods of time so in this chapter we looked at what is multitasking how memory and attention helps you in multitasking and what are those factors which one should consider in making tasks that promote multitasking thank you goodbye and namaskar